Well, today we are coming together in very interesting times when it comes to digitization and um, food transition. And in order to just mention a few, few political hooks, it's the reform of the common agricultural policy in Europe, which is not yet finalized, but we uh, are in the final phase. The national reconstruction plans um, due to the pandemic will have to fulfill fill requirements in terms of the environment, but also digitization. And when it comes to the reconstruction uh, and the billions that are being spent, this is a very important topic. And not least, the federal the government has started its work. And after several years now, the agricultural ministry is now led by a green minister and the chances and opportunities that are linked to it can be extensively discussed tonight. And right now, the new ministry, Cem Özdemir, has been a, a, in Brussels for the first time in order to attend an agricultural minister's meeting. And this is actually the background um, against which this event is going to take place tonight. Digitization in agriculture, but also when it comes to nutrition, has already arrived, basically. But so far, we've not seen too many discussions, and the political discourse has not really focused on it. Technology and digitization have, of course, um, big potential to foster the um, digital food transition, but of course it also involves some problems and we would like to point out both sides tonight. In order to uh, not um, uh, extemporize here, we only have one and a half hours, we will focus on Germany and uh, European processes, but not the global aspects, because this would actually be too much for the one and a half hours tonight. So now we are going to start with the first panelist with an uh, input statement. So all three will give a short input statement before we start with the discussion. And I would like to start with Hendrik Hase. He talks and writes about foodstuffs in the times of ecological uh, technological change. He's an author, a consultant, networker, communication designer. And as I've already mentioned together with Olaf Deininger, he has uh, written a whole book on this topic. The title is Food Code, how we can maintain the control about our food in the digital world. And this is um, highly recommended. And the authors show how digital technology is changing the whole world of food. And they describe the chances, but also the risks. And in addition, Henrik Haase has written an article recently, which is on the website of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, higher, faster, um, further. And I will uh, post the link in the chat so that you can read the article. And now I would like to ask Henrik Haase to give us a brief overview as the opening input provider, so to speak. So what are the biggest opportunities and challenges of the digitization in the field of um, agriculture and um, food? So someone needs to start my video now. So the sound should be there. Yes, the sound is there. Now the video is also available. Okay, great. So good evening. It's great that uh, you have all joined us and congratulations to Berlin, to Ms. Bender. Uh, I wish you all the best uh, for your new uh, job and, and this ministry, which will um, change many things over the next years and has to change many things if we want to adapt to crises. And part of it is also digitization from my point of view in agriculture and food. I have a few minutes time to um, speak about three main um, areas uh, or topics. I think over the past um, years, we have seen that the pandemic was an accelerator for exactly the processes that um, we, the two authors of the book, have tried to describe, which is the digitization and the agricultural sector from the farming to our um, plate, so to speak, farm to fork. And when I wrote my texts and communicated them to my co-author, I was sitting outside in a courtyard and on some days up to 15 parcel delivery um, service providers uh, came to our um, house. Uh, they all uh, delivered uh, parcel and packages and what and some even food uh, 
I found it quite interesting that sometime later there was a demonstration going on in Kreuzberg against such a food delivery service and the freed up space in retail trade were taken on by online supermarkets in some areas in Kreuzberg. And I was quite astonished by the speed um, at which it happened. And I also knew that from the farmland to your uh, fork, the technology has actually had an exponential impact. I mean, this offers opportunities, but it also brings along challenges. And it's very important to understand that we have to deal with big food data. So this is a huge amount of data, which is more and more detailed. We have more and more sensors, more and more sensitive machinery. We know that our smartphones are becoming smaller and smaller and they can do more and more. And this goes up until the tractor. And uh, even these um, machines are equipped with a lot of technology. And this um, entails a lot of opportunities when we think of the efficiency increases in agriculture that we want to achieve. I mean, we do not want to provide more fertilizers or more input, but simply through the a better monitoring of current, of current processes and uh, mechanized work uh, on the farmland, we can actually save um, a pesticides or fertilizer and we can make a different farms more comparable. And all this data is being bundled and they actually lead to a global uh, comparison or the possibility to compare uh, farms at the global scale. And this amount of data also comprises uh, nutritional data and other data. If I recommend you one thing is, if you see such a food a supplier driving past you, you should not think about the food that he supplies, but the data that is being collect collected, because these data, metadata, also nutritional data, this um, leads to this big food data that can be processed in the future and can also be used in different ways in the future. And I'm talking about these huge amounts of data. This also means that they can be abused. I mean, you can also try to make forecasts um, which lead to more consumption or also um, surveillance. And, um, and in the end, uh, surveillance of a very intimate uh, aspect of our lives, which is nutrition. However, this can already be measured today. Uh, recently, I realized that there are small sensors that measure your blood sugar level. And I thought it's only for people with diabetes, but it's also for other people who just want to check what and if what kind of an effect the food has on their body, the food that they eat. So of course you can optimize your diet and people might um, come to a more healthy lifestyle, but um, we are also reminded of 1984 and it's a little bit, um, horrifying thinking of the hands that uh, might get a grip on this kind of data. And this brings me to Bigfoot data once again. I mean, we also have the problem of infrastructure here. When we look at the uh, world today and we describe it in our book in uh, much detail, all the aspects of the supply chain, which is no longer a supply chain, but a extremely interconnected network. So the infrastructure is not in our hands in these areas. I'm quite happy that in the coalition agreement, the topic of digitization is being brought up in the field of um, food or nutrition. And the Gaia X is being mentioned. Gaia X is supposed to become the European cloud where for the first time data is being stored in a safe a public uh, sphere. The problem is that the data that we um, create and um, the platforms that we use are available to major corporations. They are stored there, processed there. And I was quite astonished that all the digital offers for farmers are stored. Uh, um, I mean, the data is stored on service by Amazon, for example. And we also heard that Bayer uh, wants to come together with Microsoft in order to um, make progress in the digitization. So here we once again have a major corporation that gets hold of large amounts of data. And I'm not sure whether Gaia X can actually counter that. And we have to discuss what we can do in order to counter that. 
so my impression is that we have already created the uh, uh, tracks on which the trains are running and these tracks belong to someone else and we are dependent on somebody else and this is actually not a driver that we need when it comes to necessary changes so i talked about infrastructure and the bigfoot data so the huge amount of data that we can make use of and the third aspect i would like to talk about is are the great innovations that we see in Europe and also in Germany by young startups or people who work at universities and found startups who really think about the possibilities of this kind of technology. And um, the only thing that I've experienced over the past years is that um, when it comes to startups and digitization that they usually forget about uh, food or nutrition. So I mean, sometimes there are these kind of ideas, but they do not get the capital, they do not get the investors, and the Federal Ministry for um, uh, uh, Food um, and Nutrition um, can make a change. Yeah, I hope that um, we will see an improvement in the future when it comes to uh, discussions at the ministerial level here, because um, when it comes to um, nutrition of food, people tend to forget that. And we have to um, make an attempt to make progress here in, in Germany. I mean, we can look to France or to the Netherlands or also uh, the US and uh, Israel. There are some um, role models where we can try to find out how we can uh, proceed. And my question to Ms. Bender would be whether the food startups are also part of your strategy, um, because I, um, yeah, I'm kind of the advocate of these as kind of startups, but this would actually be the uh, main overview. So first of all, we are uh, entering a world where digitalization and the digital cosmos is actually uh, immersed in our um, natural world. This is not one topic. This is actually um, coming together. And in the future, it might also be the artificial intelligence that plays into it. And we have to think about infrastructure in this uh, world and also the objectives and also participation and access to data. This is also what we can talk about in a minute in more detail. And when we want to leverage this potential of this new world, which is actually not that new anymore of technology and food, if we want to leverage this potential and we have to do so, because uh, if not, we will not be able to um, counter climate change, then we, of course, have to focus on innovations and the innovators that we have in Germany and also in Europe. And uh, I'm now focusing on the global level. If we do not want to be dependent on innovation from abroad, as in the digital field, for example, Facebook, uh, Zoom, etc. So many things that we could also have invented in Europe with completely different data protection regulations and different objectives. Then, of course, we have to keep the innovation in Europe, but we also have to let it fly, so to speak. We have to support it. We need um, the politicians for it. We need um, a lot of effort for it and a lot of power. And that much from my side, because um, then our future might be a little bit more digitized, which it will be anyway, more transparent, more sustainable. And I, I mean, we always talk about food, uh, hopefully also more delicious. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Hendrik Hase, thank you very much. I think that was a short and sweet overview. And hopefully the translator coped with it uh, for the sake of our English listeners, because this was highly interesting. And you said that we need to make this fly. I think that's a wonderful image. And I think it's something that we can discuss, discuss in the course of the further event, how we can make it fly. Now let's zoom in. Sylvia Bender to Germany. She studied agriculture. Uh, agri agricultural science and uh, focused on natural sciences. She worked in the bio industry for two governments. She was a speaker for um, agriculture and landscape in the German parliament. She was uh, working for the Rheinland Palatinate Ministry for Environment and um, Agriculture, and she was also State Secretary for Brandenburg, head of the Department for Biodiversity in the BUND, federal, uh, that is the German EPA. And since the 8th of September, she has been now a State Ministry in the Federal Ministry for Agriculture. And um, 
It's great to have you here. And uh, of course, I'm delighted to see that you have come here because this reflects the priority of the new federal ministry and of what's going on in the agricultural ministry anyway. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. And thank you for the congratulations too. Hopefully we can live up to your expectations, won't disappoint you. And uh, you will still welcome us two years down the road um, as a welcome guest. Anyway, we are meeting formidable challenges which lie ahead of us, not just in the area of, of food and agriculture, but in the entire economy. And uh, all of this requires a transition towards sustainable uh, and environmentally neutral value added chains when it comes to agriculture. It's very, very important that we complete this transition and therefore we need to make sure that we get this right, not just for the sake of agriculture, but also in order to accommodate climate concerns and preserve biodiversity, because these are the two biggest global challenges. And we need to make sure that we don't cut our nose to spite our face, because otherwise we won't have a sound future and everybody needs to do their bit. We need to put the shoulder to the wheel. We need to make sure that we meet the self-endorsed targets as a community of nations. And here, digital transition can play an important role in this process in order to make headway here in this respect. And that's the first thing I would like to point out. This is our first and foremost priority in our ministry. Digital transition is not an end unto itself. It's not just about digital uh, transformation. And then that is, or, or Bob is your uncle. Um, so you need to make smart use of digital uh, technology. And, and that's the only way in which it can make a contribution towards a better future and preserving a better future for our food and agricultural industries. And this is precisely what we need to do as politicians. We need to set a favorable regulatory environment framework and need to make sure that digital transformation becomes a valuable, valuable tool and is not an end unto itself. So we need to harness it anyway. Now, contrary to the food industry, agriculture, has been on board for quite some time because the digital transition has already been ushered in like a self-driving um, Self-driving is something that is used in the automotive industry and people test the waters here, but I mean, self-driving, for instance, when you have harvesters uh, is nothing new. This is already standard business. Um, and um, that means agriculture has already achieved or made, made a lot of headway in this respect in many areas. And we need to promote this progress further. We need to reduce uh, fertilizers, uh, improve uh, soil management, and also animal protection um, is high on our agenda in this regard. This is what is how high on our agenda as uh, the ministry. And Various ongoing projects uh, were launched in the, during the life of the previous government, and we can continue the, the progress here. So we have various fields where digital trans uh, solutions are being uh, tested in agriculture, for instance, artificial intelligence and other areas. So there's a lot of common ground on which we can build and uh, enhance this progress further. When it comes to nutritional uh, economy or food uh, industry, um, this has already been mentioned, the digital trans transition brings many benefits. It's not just better monitoring and better controlling, but it's also about um, tracking and tracing value added chains and um, providing customers with a certain degree of certainty and safety. And 
we can also cater to new target groups when it comes to sustainable food and groups that could not be reached with previous uh, methods of communication. So here again, we have risks and opportunities because there's a plethora of solutions out there, but there's hardly any quality management, especially solutions which are geared towards the end consumer. These solutions are legion and um, it's difficult to choose the right app, the right proposition in order to promote myself, optimize myself, optimize my nutrition. There's no genuine quality mark or quality control in order to verify whether the approaches which are being bandied around are actually the right ones. So uh, here we need to improve the situation. And uh, something else that's already been mentioned is data, topic of big data. Anyone who's familiar with what's going on in the field of agriculture will be aware of the fact that we have new fusions that emerge in the upstream areas, um, i.e. IE, um, crop manufacturers and other manufacturers. So here we see a monopolized market with a limited number of players. And we witness as, that as a result of the new mergers, the market is becoming much more consolidated and monopolized uh, with regard to digitization because the um, seed manufacturers and pesticide manufacturers get together with the uh, agricultural machine manufacturers, but also with Microsoft's and the like, and other data processing groups. So this is indeed something that should be a source of great concern for us because um, of course, it's not a good development and uh, it's absolutely necessary that policymakers keep an eye on what's going on in this field and provide the right regulatory framework in order to make sure that farmers remain the owners of their data and, and controllers of their data and that they don't become dependent on various syndicates of groups and that they're free to choose other providers. They need safety and certainty for their data. And I also understand that farmers in Germany feel that this is very important for precisely the reason that there's still an absence of certainty in this area. Therefore, they tend to be rather skeptical with regard to further digital transition. And this is where the government wants to get going. And uh, in order to inject my experience uh, from Brandenburg, also Brandenburg has become active. We want to make sure that uh, farmers have the wherewithal in order to provide sustainable management and farming. And we want to make sure that the data will be made available to all farmers and that all farmers can use this data. Now, if you're wondering whether we actually also subsume food startups under the term start uh, startups, yes, affirmative. In this area, we need more more, info, uh, more innovation, and this is what Henry Carter has pointed out. And yes, I do see that in recent years, the food area was not taken on board to the same extent or the smaller structures. And here we should absolutely change tack and harness the innovation power in the field of food startups. And 
harness the momentum of the founders in this area because I really make momentous promote momentous changes and uh, therefore we should also promote them. Well, suffice it at that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Again, there was a lot of food for thought. And we definitely pick up on what you said. And I would like to invite all viewers to use the Q&A tool. So put your questions whenever they crop up and uh, type them into the box and we'll get back to them later on. So after Germany, we will zoom out again and look at the European level because especially in the field of agricultural policy, a lot is going on at the European level with the common agricultural policy, uh, even though uh, as part of the reform, more competencies have shifted to the member states once again. The European Union is still an important player for instance, the Green Deal and Farm to Fork, et cetera, or biodiversity strategy, to name but a few important developments at the European level. And therefore, I would like to invite a European expert. He comes from Italy, and he's called Gianluca Prenoni. He's a professor for food policy, and he has been doing research for more than 30 years at the EU international, local, and regional level. And he is probably the right person to intermesh all these various levels. And he is focused on sustainable agricultural development and uh, the various uh, sustainable foods and uh, innovation processes. And um, he is act also active at the European Union. And he is the editor in chief of the magazine Edit Agriculture and Food Economics. He wrote a very interesting article in English, obviously for the NGO ARC 2020, where he describes the various European New Deal uh, fields of policy and digital digitization in the field of food and uh, agriculture. I'm posting the link in the chat. On that note, I'm going to pass the floor to Gianluca. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me to this very interesting debate. Uh, I would like also to join my uh, to the others with my congratulations with the secretary because I think that uh, we really need the people who believe in this transition. And you know when. Uh, uh, in, in countries like in Italy, for example, the ministries of agriculture are normally uh, strongly related to farmers and farmers can be a, a driver for change, but sometimes uh, uh, they have their concerns, they have, uh, let's say, some resistance to change. So sometimes uh, uh, this transition is lived uh, in uh, uh, at least uh, in a, an ambiguous way. So when there is a strong motivation to change, I think that uh, a lot of things can happen. Uh, also considering not only the uh, difficulties of a transition, but also the opportunities, and not only in terms of uh, uh, the ecological opportunities, but also the economic opportunities for farmers. So I think that the, it is very important that there are the right people at the right place. As Lisa was saying uh, in the beginning, uh, we are in a big, uh, let's say, uh, a broad uh, change. And this change is starting, first of all, uh, in concepts and in frameworks. So it, it is main, uh, first of all, in our minds. 10 years ago wouldn't be possible to talk about ecological transition. It was uh, something that it, it, it was not allowed. And now we see that there are extremely ambitious targets uh, that are already defined in the, in the Green Deal. And we have already seen how difficult it is, for example, to pursue policy coherence between, for example, what is saying in the Green Deal and what is actually uh, approved into the common agricultural policy. But nevertheless, this is 
a process. And if the process starts from language, I think that uh, we are on the, on the right track. So uh, what uh, is uh, uh, the, the Green Deal uh, proposing at this moment? I think that uh, uh, there are at least two uh, very big issues to, to keep into consideration. The first one is that uh, the Green Deal recognizes that uh, there is a strong link between food and agriculture. This was not uh, like this in the past. And I think that uh, this is one important aspect to keep together food and agriculture. What agriculture we want uh, in order to have uh, sustainable food systems. And sustainable food system means give the possibility to all to enjoy uh, healthy diets without getting pressure on the uh, on natural resources and on the environment. But this means a huge uh, change, and not only in the agricultural field, but also in the consumption field. So we have to start with changing the approach to demand. And if we consider that uh, uh, demand compatible with uh, a sustainable food system should reduce, first of all, the food uh, we eat, because we eat too much simply uh, on average, but uh, we eat too much, especially in Europe. And uh, we should avoid the waste because we, we waste too much, 30% apparently, uh, also at household level, and if possible, we should reuse. So this means that uh, our consumption should enter into uh, closed loops of uh, use of the biomass of the, the natural resources. And, and this should be done while uh, regenerating our soils, our waters, our uh, biodiversity. Uh, the second aspect is related to the rural vision. You may know that uh, the European Commission has launched this uh, strategic document on the long-term vision for rural areas. And also this is going to be uh, very uh, challenging because we have to rethink the relationship between uh, uh, urban and rural areas, between town and countryside, and we have to think out of uh, the, the economies and of the life of rural areas. Uh, and on this regard, the digitalization can be uh, of extreme uh, help because it helps us to, uh, to have a, an imagination of a rural futures that uh, we couldn't imagine in the past. So let me start from uh, this rural vision, for example. What uh, is a rural uh, vision of the future look like? I think that we have to consider, uh, for example, the COVID has shown us that it is possible to detach localization from presence. So I can be present, I'm here in Italy, but I am talking to you, and this would be uh, unimaginable 10 years ago. Uh, and I can work uh, from everywhere. So this means that if I am located in a place, I can uh, work uh, uh, remotely, but I, at the same time, I can contribute to my rural community. And this is something that uh, re-equilibrates the, the relation between rural and urban areas. But uh, also in order to, to live in the countryside, I need to have access to services and e-commerce, for example, helps us or e-health uh, if it not considers as a, a replacement of just a, a good health. In this case, e-health, uh, health at a distance can support services and can 
uh, provide people the access to services uh, also in rural areas. But uh, you, you can uh, consider all the issues related to e-government. So the possibility for uh, citizens not to travel a lot to get a certificate or to talk, talk with a person in the administration, but having the possibility to do it uh, from home, from their uh, village. So I think that uh, these aspects uh, could uh, change significantly the way we think uh, rural areas and we think uh, rural areas as a place that uh, can be attractive for tourists, for citizens, for inhabitants, etc. but also can attract skilled labor that maybe they, they cannot move, but still the labor can work for uh, rural areas because rural areas in the new vision, they will need the skilled works. Um, but uh, going to agriculture and, and food, I think that uh, there are, lot of opportunities uh, and uh, we will talk also about constraints but opportunities for example in, in the agricultural field is uh, related to the capacity of prediction i think this is the most important if we don't want to use pesticides we have to predict a uh, pest occurrence if we wanted to avoid uh, let's say to to have um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, weather events, uh, you have to be able to anticipate them. If you want to, to avoid the breaking down of a machine, you need the sensors that help you to understand when uh, you should replace this piece or, or the other piece. And maybe uh, 3D printing, for example, will help the farmer to, uh, to, to produce a replacement uh, uh, let's say, peace instead of uh, traveling uh, to buy it uh, somewhere. So I think that uh, this issue of prediction is uh, one of the most powerful things that uh, we, we could, uh, uh, let's say, use in our approach. I'm, I'm stopping uh, just, uh, just to, to end uh, the, yes. the, the last 30 seconds. I think that uh, uh, also for consumption, it will be uh, incredibly important. Uh, we, most people start to understand that they have to change their diets, but they don't have enough information that can uh, drive their choice. And so this is important as already uh, the others said before me, uh, that there are possibilities to have information that can uh, change day to day by day our uh, behavior. And this will really make the difference because uh, routines are the most difficult things to change. And I think that uh, we have to start from that, uh, providing that uh, we have a vision of the future of the food system and of rural areas. Thank you and sorry for being uh, too long. Grazie mille, Professore Brunori. Um, Ich werde jetzt wieder auf Deutsch. I will continue in German now, but thank you very much uh, for being with us. It's not always so easy to follow the German contributions in the translation. So, um, and also thank you for your remark in terms of the farm to fork that we have a more holistic approach at the European level, not always um, food and agriculture as two separate. Uh, items, but we will have to wait until the strategy unfolds. And much is dependent, of course, on the national strategy plans, which the uh, member states now have to submit um, by uh, January 22. And I would like to come back to Silvia Bender and her new role and new capacity in the uh, in this uh, federal government. And also, thank you for the comment that the networking or the connectedness in the rural area is very important um, in the European New Deal and also the national reconstruction plans. We always uh, read, leave no one behind, always with a view to the uh, digitization and the um, 
uh, transition. And in line with the Farm to Fork strategy, I would like to uh, conduct the first round of uh, questions, which um, refers to many different aspects of this chain. And uh, Professor uh, Brinori has already talked about it. So the capacity of prediction is very important that we are able to predict better uh, based on satellite data and um, might reduce the utilization of pesticides, for example. So first of all, I would like to talk about the first phase of our food production and also focus on best practices. So in terms of digitization, what is happening at the moment? And as if your Ben has already mentioned that it's not an end in itself. We have certain targets. How can we achieve or reach those um, targets based on digitization? So in the coalition agreement, we see different aspects like digital applications uh, for the targeted um, utilization or the fostering of alternatives to synthetic pesticides and also robots and drones are being mentioned in the coalition agreement. So, Sevier Bender, how will the new ministry incorporate digitization um, in a way that it makes sense when it comes to agriculture? Well, First of all, I would like to say that in the three days that we have been in office now, we have not yet fully thought through all the different strategies. Uh, so first of all, it's a description of our objectives, but it's not uh, um, thought through right until the end how we are going to implement it over the next uh, years. And I'd like to apologize for that. Uh, coming back to your question, how can we support digitization in a sense of farm to fork and in the sense of a more sustainable agriculture and how can digitization be used in the farms? I think three aspects are important here. One is connected to the view that we need uh, prognostic data. We need data on the soil. We have to know about the quality of the soil, where it's humid, where it's dry. So all this is information which are of utmost importance. And digitization can actually be used here in order to achieve more sustainability. And this is also something that I've touched upon a moment ago. It's very important that this these good data are publicly available. This is actually the responsibility of uh, politics, of the administration to gather this data and to make it available to the farmers so that they can make use of it. And they should not, for example, have to pay for it or use additional funding for it. And one approach is, for example, based on Gaia-X, but also different federal states want to use a so-called geobox uh, system, which is a data system which is being used in eight different federal states in Germany, where data is uh, collected and um, farmers are getting access to these data. And this is a very important aspect from my point of view, we have to support developments and also assume responsibility so that these data are and remain publicly available and that the data has or is of good quality. Well, the second thing is that developments and innovation have to be um, driven forward also in the agricultural sector and in different areas we uh, have um, support programs for example one is called digitization and in the agricultural sector 
and can link to that a competency network. And here we uh, make test trends in, in model farms in order to find out how digital technology can be used in an optimal way in order to protect the environment and also to increase the efficiency, maintain the biodiversity, and also to reduce the, the workload for the respective farms. And these experimental um, farms are ongoing, they're in operation. And of course, the um, results of it will then be put into the agricultural practice in the future. In addition, there are also other areas where we are active. One thing is the support of artificial intelligence in agriculture and the food chain. And when it comes to a healthy nutrition, we also have a supportive program where 35 programs have been selected. They are supposed to be launched soon. And there is also um, funding for future regions and future farms where we try to um, think of the whole agricultural production in a holistic way. And um, with the public funds available, we want to give the respective impulse or impetus so that uh, digital tools can be used in the right way. A question from the audience, Lutz Gebenbusch would like to ask you about the quality and neutrality of information this is also an issue in the agricultural sector. The providers of pesticides and fertilizers provide apps, but they, of course, have more funds available in order to advertise their products. So should politics um, react to that? And if yes, how? Well, first of all, politics should, as a first step, provide uh, independent, neutral advice to the farmers or support neutral uh, counseling. So information, for example, how is the pest situation right now and what should we do? So this kind of information should not be or not only be provided by the producers of these products, but for example, by uh, authorities in the federal states or by public research institutes. So my first approach here would be we have to provide or counter this by more um, neutral information, which is uh, easily accessible in order to provide advice to the farmers what they should do. And if this is not sufficient, we should also consider further steps. Thank you very much. I think Hendrik Haas uh, would also like to reply to this uh, when it comes to data sovereignty and also the access to data, also usability, and also the market power of some corporations when it comes to these kind of data. And in order to limit it, please stick to the farmers themselves and the problems in terms of the data access and also the power of uh, some of the corporations. Well, yes. For me, it's always very important, um, and, and now I would like to um, disappoint you maybe a little bit. We have to be clear that we are talking about a change of paradigm when it comes to food. I would like to start to Calabria, in Calabria, and greetings to Italy. Uh, I ordered oranges with Antonio Buttelieri in Calabria. Uh, several weeks ago, and they are sent to me now because they are now ripe and were harvested. And I did it via a platform that used crowdfunding. So I had a direct, direct um, connection to the producer. I get Google Maps data, etc. So this is also an opportunity for rural areas. And for the first time, I bought oranges in a way that we will see more often, more frequently in the future. And this farmer has access to this platform uh, called crowdfunding or which uses crowdfunding. So this is actually a platform that deals with food. The change in paradigm 
is that in the future, the question will be who has the dominance, so to speak, of the platform agriculture or the platform food. I'm thinking of other business fields. For example, I also bought music when I was young. These were CDs. I went to shop, bought CDs, took them home. And today I've got an app which is called Spotify. There's also Amazon Music or Apple Music, and I have to pay 10 euros. Um, and then the whole world of music is in my pocket whenever I want it. And this is actually the change of paradigm. So when you take a look at the many examples, this is a change that is underway, or at least will arrive in the future. And the change of paradigm in agriculture, I think, means that in the future, we sh will not try to reduce um, the, the amount of pesticides, etc., but to provide predictions. So the business model of the big corporations will be to sell uh, predictions as accurate as possible and it's similar to spotify by the way you can just enter your favorites and then you get your playlist but um, keeping this in mind when we think about agriculture then we see that agriculture the agricultural sector is not really prepared um, i'm not yet talking about uh, data sovereignty or uh, similar things so the farmers need access they need access to the processing of data and access to results to um, forecasts it's similar to music i mean i owned the cd i could listen to it as many times as possible as, as i liked and with spotify or other providers i have to pay otherwise i lose access so in mobility it's the same thing uh, not everyone wants to buy a car today. We just want to have access to mobility. We want to have access to food. But who will be the ones who provide the funding? Who will lead to this bottleneck? Who will provide access? At the moment, it's still um, unclear. But my worry is that in the future, we will see more monopolies. <clears throat> and this will no longer be Aldi's or others. These will be tech corporations or also the seed producers in china they're already playing around with this kind of models <clears throat> and we should take a closer look uh, in order to learn how we can react to it policy wise the the farmers need access not only to the data but the forecasts and this brings us back to the quality control and i fully agree to miss bender we have to look at the apps uh, on the one hand, but the um, forecast is actually the problem. The question is, which algorithm is actually providing me with which forecast about my food? What is the sensor linked to my wristwatch doing, um, etc.? We do no longer have access to these algorithms. And what's worse is that the farmers actually cut off from the processing part of that data. So this is the same phenomenon that we see when it comes to personal data and Facebook and WhatsApp, etc. So we are completely cut off from the processing of these data. Also, uh, politics is cut off. So the insights that you gain from this huge amount of data, which might create a comparability, um, which is the more sustain most sustainable farm or um, other aspects, um, I mean, we will have to uh, pay a lot in order to get these insights, pay a lot to the tech uh, corporations. And uh, Gaia X in the European area, for example, would be a solution. And I have been reading a very interesting book by Michael Seemann. It's about the power of platforms. And he says that Gaia X. I mean, you have created an ecosystem and when you talk about the real world where you say, well, first we put in real animals and then you suddenly notice that the animals are not surviving because you forgot to think about humans or microorganisms. So with Gaia X, it's a grand gesture. They try to create a huge network, but they forget that the basis is still missing and the ecosystem cannot work.
now because Gaia X at the moment is dependent on the expertise by Google, Amazon and other uh, corporations because the system cannot survive on its own. So this is why I would like to make a plea in order um, for um, um, considering um, change of paradigm. So agriculture of the future needs to be thought differently. We still have to um, think of the challenges and we should not work together with the corporations creating similar limitations to access as we already know from other platforms. So it's not about owning data. I do not want to own a CD, but I want to have access to music. And this is what we have to think about. And when we think about uh, music and Spotify, um, Amazon Music, etc., and, and agriculture and farming and food stuff. So corporations like Bayer who come together with Microsoft to have bought a huge set of data from Monsanto. And of course, it's not about uh, glyphosate. Um, the merger was not about glyphosate, but they knew that um, Monsanto was one of the biggest data collectors. And this is also something that we have to face up to when we think about digitization. It's um, very often that people think of an exchange of a fax machine by something else, but we have to think bigger, um, in particular when it comes to the objectives. You cannot own the tracks and not be able to say where the train has to go. And we have to rethink the situation in order to go one step further in terms of our policy. Thank you very much, Hendrik Haase. This is actually already the intersection. It's quite clear that we cannot make a clear uh, cut here or distinction between the marketing and the end consumers and the farms. But there was still uh, still another question from an English um, speaking participant, and I would like to ask you, Mr. Haase, and I will read it out in English. The transport footprint shown in this or any other platform to buy food. Um, are, do you have any thoughts on how to assess food mobility and how to make it more sustainable with a better understanding on from where to where the food is going? Also es geht darum, wie können wir Klimaziele auch uh, dadurch erreichen, indem wir Transport... How can we achieve climate uh, objectives by shortening uh, transport uh, routes and how can apps help us uh, do that? Oh, well, I understand I need to slow down and speak slower. Thank you so much. Uh, so that was just planned up by the um, interpreter. Anyway, what's so fascinating here, let me put this differently, the long transportation routes and the products that we find in today's supermarkets have been optimized in order to increase their shelf life. So uh, when I get fresh oranges from my farmer, my farmer, the quote unquote, well, the farmer with whom I have a partnership, where well, uh, he can pick these oranges much uh, earlier and greener because it, he knows the route takes two days until it reaches Henry Kaze. And that means he can select crops for uh, cultivation which uh, survives the two-day transport so a more direct link and a closer closer knowledge of who is going to use my goods when where um, optimizes my business so products can become richer better more diverse because this uh, is optimized and in a supermarket and um, you, you, you have a mass market, you have mass products and big, big warehouse. And that's what uh, the supermarket has. It's an algorithm which has a barcode and then you scan it. Now, if you look at the transportation routes, then digital transformation can help us because it allows us to better plan the market. We have a sound data, it's in good hands, that's a disc disclaimer. And this uh, allows us to cater to the markets in the region research of our book, we came to across many examples where we could reduce waste of foods. We had even uh, cruise ships which could become smaller because the kitchens were smaller because they could serve better and a more targeted way. With And in the old days, they just took passenger figures and uh, did ballpark planner. And this, these footprints and um, is allowed by having more data. But here you see 
that first of all you need to gather data you need to collate data and that brings me back to my preliminary remarks i mean this is where it needs to be stored in a secure place and where um, where you don't need to ring amazon please give us the data you have uh, that much of the data and uh, that's not on so the data which is becoming increasingly important in order to better plan uh, delivery chains need to be trackable and forecast uh, and we need to be able to forecast them thank you very much now let's look at the european fields and hear from uh, professor bonori what he thinks about the potential of the european legislation for instance, common agriculture policy and it's re and in your research, did you come across best practice that you would like to share and because you feel they could be uh, role models for other countries in Europe and what is the role that the European Union can play with regard to legislation and also with regard to national strategy plans and what are your expectations professor when it comes to the German government or when it comes to the national strategy plans which are currently being drafted at the level of member states so any must-haves with regard to these plans yes thank you Lisa I think that uh... Uh, the European level is crucial for coordination of uh, uh, all efforts and also to share uh, good practices and uh, share information. And um, I, I can come back to the discussion uh, before about oranges. Uh, we see that, for example, in Italy, we have a, a huge diversity of uh, food products, uh, a huge diversity of quality, but in most of the cases, uh, small farmers, uh, uh, artisans, etc., couldn't find a market for themselves because there were intermediaries that wanted uh, big quantities and didn't want uh, to uh, manage too much diversity. So. Uh, with the e-commerce, e with the possibility of communicating at the distance. Now, as more farmers from Calabria can go uh, to Germany, but uh, even much further. So this is a, a, a huge uh, difference uh, compared to the past. But as uh, it was said before, uh, now there are other problems coming, for example, the transportation. But then uh, we have some... Uh, uh, examples from France, for example, La Charrette is a, a, a platform that uh, allows to share transportation. So if a farmer, for example, from Calabria has um, uh, an empty uh, tract uh, back, he can uh, be hired by someone from France that want to, to send cheese to, to Calabria or to Italy in general. And in this case, they will uh, 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 share the cost of transportation, but also to they will reduce the uh, ecological impact of the uh, transformation, uh, tra uh, the uh, transportation, because this means that uh, they can use uh, spare resources. And uh, uh, digitalization is also about this uh, capacity of. Uh, using, uh, let's say, spare resources, resources that otherwise would be left uh, un unused. But uh, as it was said before, the, the crucial point is the governance of this system. So who owns the data? What are the rules for sharing the data? Who is producing it, etc. So I think that we have to consider, first of all, open data so they can be accessible open software so software can be uh, let's say transformed and modified etc and also um, uh, sharing uh, but also open platforms we need to understand the role of the platforms in the next future and in my view these platforms may be private i would prefer public versus private but at the same time, they should have rules for managing their data and for releasing that data. But also it is important that the farmers are willing to share their data and to build, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, cyber spheres from below, because this 
is a, a process we have to consider. But in order to do this, for example, we need the standards. So data should be, uh, should be communicating with each other. We talk about interoperability. And this is something that uh, uh, could be done at, uh, uh, at the general level, at national or at, um, at a European level. And so I think that, that there is a lot to do because we have two important instruments. One is uh, public research. And the second one is public funding to agriculture. So why not linking uh, public funding to openness. I think that uh, this would uh, contribute a lot to create uh, an European data space. Uh, what about Germany? Oh, I think that Germany now has really um, uh, a key role in uh, this transition because uh, you can really give the example to the rest of Europe to, to see how the uh, transition can be uh, carried out uh, with uh, supporting farmers, especially family farmers, but at the same time thinking to a different model of economy based on diversity, based on circularity, and based on, uh, let's say, different approach to consumption, responsible and, and sustainable consumption. So I think that uh, the way Germany can uh, steer the, the, the rest of Europe is in this uh, case uh, uh, incredibly powerful. And I, I really think that uh, if uh, Germany starts to apply in a, a coherent way uh, the strategic plans, uh, all the others will follow sooner or later. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, um, Gianluca Brunori. Um, und das war auch eine gute Überleitung uh, nun vom. And that was an excellent segue from the field, from marketing to the plate, and uh, you know, get, getting back to Germany. Now time flies, and therefore let me um, add two questions. Put two questions to you, Sylvia Bender. First of all, nutrition. So not just talking about agricultural production, but uh, when it comes to digitization and how far can it uh, promote the food transition in the coalition agreement, it says something about the environmental footprint or nutri score system, etc. And Hendrik Hase in his article also says uh, when uh, whenever we have digital vaccination certificates, then we should also have digital food certificates. So what are the approaches and maybe some best practice examples from Brandenburg in the field of digitization and food transition? Second question straight away. With regard to the processes in policy making specifically, now up to now, um, food the food sector was missing or agriculture was missing when we were talking about the important topics at the table. I mean, artificial intelligence and also the future commission of agriculture uh, took place in the absence of food tech and startups. So how can you network better also institutionally speaking and also in terms of the personnel? Because uh, here I had another question in the q and section. Let me just throw it. The most secure trade relations are based on trust. Trust um, is created between human beings. How does the ministry promote an environmental impact study when it comes to the implementation of the digitalization strategy? So two questions to you, food transition and your projects and the policy making in your institution. I think when it comes to digitization in the food um, in this your food production, we are lagging a little bit behind to what we've already achieved in the agricultural sector. But I share the view of the other panelists that a lot is ongoing at the moment. For example, when it comes to a regional value creation chains and joint transport, uh, routes or also the traceability of certain products from the farm to the fork. So we 
have to pay close attention to it. We have to support good solutions and we have to support those who have already launched good solutions at the federal state level as well as the national level. Um, the German federal states, which are actually focused on regional value creation chains, of course, uh, know that digitization can make a good contribution, but we uh, have to focus on it. And uh, the support of the consumers in their healthy nutrition means that um, <clears throat> digitization is also very important here. And um, apps can provide you with certain information on the products. And this is very important. But it needs to be accompanied by two main things. One is a good uh, nutrition education in the schools and elsewhere so that uh, I can really make use of the information that I'm provided with. And when I need what, when I know what I need, what my body needs, what sustainability means, then I can really make use of the information that I've, that I'm given by the different apps and I'm able to take a decision, an informed decision. And secondly, we have to try to find out whether the many apps that are on the market already and which are not subjected to any quality control, whether we can create a system so that the different apps that are available can be certified, so to speak, as, as good or not so useful. And this is also something that we have to focus on in order to make sure that the consumers get good information. When it comes to agriculture and digitization in the different um, commissions and processes, we have to definitely focus on that. This will be a main issue for the new federal government to also be more active in this area. And the Future Commission Agriculture has not yet focused on it, but um, I think the reason is that different uh, opponents who are standing on different sides and who have not found common ground over decades, but rather fought against each other, now have to be brought together to the table. And I think many people would not have expected that the future commission would provide us with such a good paper, but it did. It created a joint target vision and also describe the path towards this vision. And this is also something that we will have to implement. And this is our benchmark. And of course, we will also more strongly focus on startups and digitization experts, because in many areas, digitization is one aspect of the solution or one part of uh, reaching the objectives. Thank you very much for the uh, reply. There's no direct uh, follow-up question. So this brings me to Henrik Haase right away. So your assessment in terms of the future of these kind of food labels, Nutri-Score, animal protection labels, etc., but also the overall potential. How can we leverage the potential of digitization in the field of healthy and sustainable food for everybody? <clears throat> And everyone uh, who's diverse, you forgot that. So I think we have to um, take a look at the meta level, which is uh, represented by me, so to speak. I would recommend to pay close attention. Ms. Bender is talking about apps, and I think it's great that it's also part of the program, that apps are now becoming part of the uh, food strategy, and that you say that they need to undergo a quality check. But please let us not talk about apps, but data systems, rather. I would like to give you an example. There is an app. I'm not giving you any name. It is a purchasing or um, a grocery list app, so to speak. So it's an app which can provide you with 
recipes or the, the app actually um, incorporates recipes and based on these recipes the app generates the amounts that you have to the amounts of grocery that you have to buy and of course within the app you can also buy uh, food via an online platform so this app is something in between of an online uh, trade cooking book um, and also a, a shop so of course the app can show you how you can consume more sustainably or more healthy but the app is not the problem the overall universe that is created here is the problem we see this kind of platform which has access to a lot of data and also connects data and the, a lot of these apps out there and in the case of this specific app is no longer in the hands of the startups a young Irish person but it was sold to a kitchen appliance producer which is Samsung and they are actually incorporating this into their appliances for example it's a fridge and then the fridge says, well, you've got this or that in your fridge, so cook this or that, then it's going to be more sustainable and you will live more healthy. And how are we going to check this in terms of quality? I think we have to discuss what the right leverage is. We are no longer talking about food labels here, but actually algorithms of food startups. And we have to broaden our view. So what is... Um, uh, the thing that we have to do here. So with the understanding of our digital possibilities, I also look at other aspects. I mean, even before the election, I was quite critical. Um, for example, an algorithm sometimes includes certain aspects like organic or whole uh, grain, um, and uh, this is difficult. So I need to get access and insights into the algorithms in order to measure the quality of the algorithms. And are there any um, review mechanisms and how can we do this? And if we go one step further, there are also DNA analyses that um, say that you just have to uh, send us a cell of yours or a blood sample and then companies startups can create a nutrition recommendations for you and i think for this world we need a completely different set of quality controls um this is something i wanted to to mention here because i see quite frequently that we've fall into a trap i mean with facebook we thought well this is just an app where you can talk to each other you can send messages to each other but we have not understood what is um the basis of it and what kind of business model is um part of facebook and where facebook um gets all the data from and um some years later we need a police force in front of the german parliament the reichstag because uh, um certain things have evolved on this platform. And when it comes to the food sector, I think the developments have not yet gone that far, but um, they are accelerating. And I just remind you of Bayer, or for example, there's a demonstration in Kreuzberg, district of Berlin against a food supplier um, or supply service. And um, it's not only sufficient when we talk about these apps, whether the apps makes good suggestions, but the important thing is that we check what is put into this app. Because the algorithm actually is the thing that is uh, very important here. I hope that I could describe it um, uh, sufficiently. So, I think it's not only about these labels, uh, for example, for um, um, meat uh, or others, but uh, we have to think about where's the point of sale? Is it still a supermarket? Can I put the label on a physical product or is it simply an online trade where they no longer have, for example, the packaging? And then the question is, where can we actually um, do this quality uh, control and where does it make sense? And I know that's quite a lot to digest now, but I think we have to think one step um, 
beyond um, this is actually um, I mean to to just think about um, apps and and supermarkets and labels is not um, digital enough from my point of view and um, if you remember the start slide the telephone that scans the plate and derives nutritional values from it uh, maybe many of you might have thought this is a picture of the future but I look at this slide and think, okay, this is an app that I know. And the question now is, what does this do to our nutrition? <laughs> because there's AI that can look at your plate and derive nutritional um, values from it and make predictions. The question is, who is doing the checks, the controls, whether the app is correct? And I'm now once again with Ms. Bender. But once again, we have to look at the algorithms that lie behind it or that are the basis of it in order to find out whether the uh, app comes to the right conclusion. Well, thank you very much. So the wish list is quite long and maybe the label will no longer be put onto the plastic packaging. Maybe there will not be a packaging anymore or a different kind of packaging. So thank you very much for your uh, comments. And uh, I would like to invite all uh, participants here to read the article and the book of Mr. Haas, but also of Professor Brinori. And now I would like to come back to you, Professor Brinori, uh, in terms of nutrition. And um, we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately, but you already mentioned that something needs to happen when it comes to consumption and diet. So the consumption patterns have to change. The European um, politics was quite hesitant and also most of the member states. So. Where do you think are opportunities here when it comes to the nutrition change? Yes, thank you, Lisa. I think, uh, to, to be sure, that the key to understand the, the, the strategies related to food will be uh, related to the food environment. So the, the set of uh, uh, aspects that influence consumers in their choice and in their in their consumption practices. And labeling can be one of them, but also the setting. It is not necessary that people go to supermarkets in the future, maybe because we have seen also an evolution of retailing from big supermarkets. So we are in an aging area, so we are getting back to smaller supermarkets. And farmers markets, for example, are blossoming and there is e-commerce, there are other aspects. So we have to, to, to really to imagine how a consumer could be influenced in their choice uh, related to the, uh, let's say, the, the messages and the stimuli they, they get. And I think that the example of the Nutri-Score is a very interesting example. Uh, you may know that in Italy, Nutri-Score is not very loved, actually on the contrary. But uh, personally, I think that uh, this uh, contrariety to Nutri-Score is related to the fact that uh, we have some products that are a little bit fatty, uh, or, for example, some cheeses, uh, some sausages, etc. But I suspect also that in this, let's say, Italian uh, position against Nutri-Score, there is also the, the interests of some uh, industries like Ferrero, who produces Nutella, which is not a traditional product. Uh, I mean, traditional, but not so traditional as we would expect. So there is a, a politics around it. What does sustainable diet mean? For example, in Italy, there is a lot of debate about the Mediterranean diet. So how to transfer this concept of Mediterranean diet into a label? I think that this is a key aspect. And if we link this aspect to the food environment, we will see what is the importance of cities. And, and this is the last thing I would like to, to say. Cities are the place where people live and consume. And the way cities organize eating, consumption, purchasing, but also cultivating, growing food 
uh, can make a difference because they can educate, they can provide information, etc. And also there is a lot of, uh, let's say, civic engagement in cities. So I think that in the next future, policies will have to involve heavily cities, cities in the nutrition transition for, for Europe. And we have a, a lot of examples. Uh, we started from Milan. As you know, the Milan has been as far ahead of the, the kind of Milan food packs. And now there are a lot of food councils around Europe. I think that this issue of food councils, so actors that contribute actively to a redefinition of the principles of uh, sustainable consumption uh, uh, tailored to the characteristic of the area and also to the needs of, uh, of people. Uh, back to you, Lisa, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're all hungry now for dinner. Oh, uh, ich sollte Deutsch reden. Uh, Okay, I'm going to speak German again. I think we are all hungry and looking forward to our dinner. And the, now we have to come to an end. I hope that we could provide you some food for thought when it comes to digitization in the agricultural sector as well as in the food sector. And uh, of course, uh, this is an ongoing development. And this is why it's uh, the more important for politicians, journalists, but every, also every one of us in society to think about these developments and get information that the new government has really uh, a lot on its plate. And maybe they can also use the G7 uh, platform in order to make progress here so that it's not uh, digitization is not an end in itself, but actually helps to reach the climate objectives also at the European level, a lot is ongoing. And um, it's about uh, having a holistic view on the different transitions, ecological, digital, agriculture, etc. Um, of course, there are many other topics, but we cannot cover everything in 90 minutes. Um, for example, the social question when it comes to delivery services and how ecological is it when we see the big data centers. So there's a lot um, that we still can discuss, and I hope that you remain in contact. Thank you very much to all the different panelists, the audience, and also the tech support in the background. And um, I would be pleased if you could would take the time to uh, fill in just a brief digital survey so that we can continue to improve our e digital events. And when you've done so, I would like to um, say goodbye and enjoy your evening, hopefully with a nice dinner. And also thank you very much to the interpreters who uh, had a difficult job uh, in view of the passion tonight. Um, so thank you very much and goodbye.